Hello, Michael. How are you? Very good, Ebony. Thank you for, uh, for the interview. Looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I am with Cooperative Journal, a, a website that focuses on different interviews with different cooperative models around the world. And so I'm so excited to learn about Ghana's intentional community. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. Um, so just tell me, how did Ghana's get started? Well, uh, the Ghana's community, where we're located in Staten Island, New York, uh, got started in 1980. And, uh, we weren't thinking in terms of starting an intentional community. In fact, hardly any of the original six or seven people even knew that entity called intentional community. <clears throat> that happened later on. But basically, uh, everyone who got, uh, of that original group had been concerned in various kinds of ways and through various kinds of experiences with the fact that people who really want to do something special and they want to be in it together constantly run into the problems that anyone is going to run into when that they work together or try to create something together and far more often than not, they wouldn't really be able to deal with those problems at a certain point. And what usually happened when they got to that point is if the project continued, it fell back into the old pattern of decisions being made behind closed doors and the bitching and the moaning happening out by the water cooler, mm -hmm. or symbolically speaking. And uh, so we were wanting to come together, work and live together. And the objective was to kind of be a, a laboratory in which we were both the guinea pigs and the lab coats because we knew if we started doing something together, the problems would come up. Ah, here we go. Now we have the situation. Why is it so difficult to talk to each other about what's going on and what's wanted and what we can do to, uh, uh, to make things work better? And one of us had developed a, uh, she was a longtime uh, psychotherapist and uh, uh, group therapist. And she had started a, uh, a private school and to develop a thing called human relations educators. She had eventually evolved a, a thing called feedback learning. And that was basically, what can we do to learn how to be available to receive information about my own performance, how I'm impacting other people in the group or in the situation or whatever. I mean, how am I impacting myself that's frustrating me from getting the things that I want in my life? Mm. To be able to uh, be more open to that kind of information and to learn how to give that information as well as possible. And that's how it all started. A group of people that wanted to engage in that project. Interesting. So does the feedback learning still continue at Ghana's? The first, uh, 15 to 20 years, it was an intense focus 
uh, of the community. Um, and in that same period, we, we expanded from that six or seven, that group of six or seven, to almost 100 people living together in 10 houses and uh, operating three distinct retail businesses, uh, all focused on uh, recycling. Um, and, uh, and since then, the next half of our, of our 40 year history, has been much less of a focus on, uh, intense focus on it. Um, it was like a 24 seven project for a very long time. And people reached a point, you know, there's other things in life to do besides, but we wanted to keep the community and we wanted to and, and, and sustain the culture. So uh, we, uh, uh, our engagement in the feedback learning was very instrumental in developing the culture of the com of, uh, of the community, mm -hmm. and so that has continued, and uh, and it's uh, the, the feedback learning is an underlying practice, uh, but we're not really de having developed it and expanded it or taking it you know uh, to other levels, uh, so. Yes and no to, is the answer to your question. Yeah. So how much property does Ghana's own and how did you acquire it? Um, at the present time, uh, we have uh, seven residential buildings and uh, five commercial buildings. Uh, we have one residential build, uh, a combination residential commercial building that is being leased uh, by another group. That's, so that's no longer part of the, of the community. Um, and the, uh, the question, uh, how did we acquire it, really opens up into a major part of the whole culture. Um, the original group, very soon after we got together, made a very clear decision that uh, this is going to be a lifelong project, probably, and um, I'd like to be part of it, and we would like to be part of it. So we decided to pool all our resources, money, skills, heart, everything, as much as possible. Um, so, um, out of that original group, there was one who worked on Wall Street and one who was a, uh, a medical doctor and hospital administrator. So, they were making rather large salaries mm -hmm. and all of this was being pooled. And one of the one of the guiding principles from the very beginning also was that uh, everyone's work engaged in this project is uh, of equal value. There isn't anything that's more important than what the other person is doing. So all of that sharing was uh, was valued as as, as equal. Uh, We've included inheritance in that public to some extent, and to some extent we haven't. It's been, you know, kind of a whole flexible item. But anyway, it is through the income sharing that was part of this sharing everything uh, that we accumulated the capital so that when more people came, we would buy another house. And more people would come and we would buy a house. And we decided to open up a retail business and we had the capital to, to buy the building. And prices at that time were much more realistic than they are now. Uh, and so over a period of about 10, 12 years, we went from uh, owning one house to owning 10 and five commercial buildings. And then when we decided to step back, um, 
from the, the intense focus of, of the research project. We um, started also to, to reduce the size of the community to, to bring, you know, the, co the scope of work down to, to, to a more manageable level. And so since then, we, we so, so now, instead of having 10 residentials, we have seven. And so you noticed that there still wasn't a sort of hierarchy, despite having people that had higher societal status in terms of income um, versus those that didn't and what they contributed? Well, I'm going to have to step back a little bit to give more context, okay? So, uh, when we started the project, we found people who were attracted to the project in various kinds of ways. Most of the people that were attracted to it and came to it and, and, and joined with us were not interested in pooling their resources as we were. Uh, the we should it has a very uh, name the core group. So, uh, so we had people who were living here, and, and over the years that expanded, we had people living here who were very interested in the project, but in a more limited way, and then we had people who were really interested in living here because it was a really cool place to live. And, but they were not that interested in the project. Mm. So they didn't become part of that project, but they were within the culture that embraced the whole, the whole community because the, the, the people involved in the project were really the ones generating and developing the, uh, the culture that we've developed. And that's, that's, Probably one of the key things, at least for me, that I've learned is that uh, you create a way of life by creating a culture. And, and you, you generate the structures to serve the way of life you want. So it's the culture it has a much more primary role than the structures because if the structures aren't serving the way you want to work, you change them. Mm. It's the, and the structures impact the way of life, of course, and it's a reciprocal thing. But the, uh, the really dynamic force in an organization or a community is the culture. And uh, so, and there were, there were uh, a lot of the people who came who weren't really interested in the project that kind of covered a whole range of people who were just there i mean it's very affordable you know and that served a very strong purpose many people have come because they had a project short-term project a training project or something in new york city and they found this to be a very convenient way to live on a temporary six month eight month basis whatever We've had people who come who wanted to spend a month just visiting New York City. And we've had people who just say, you know, this is really cool. I like it. And I just just want to be here. And I don't necessarily want to be part of uh, anything in any kind of major way. So we've had always this range of, uh, of people within the, uh, uh, the life of the community. Mm -hmm. I think that's so important because based off of the intentional communities that I've gone to, I mean, I'm sure they all adhere to the shared value system that you guys have, but it's, but the ones that I have visited, it seems to be this very like, um, everyone has these idealistic values and if you're not a part of every single thing that they do, then you can't be a part of the community. Like there's a really intense screening process and consensus and everything. And so I think having different tiers of people that are involved in the community can help it 
be more long lasting as well. Um, egalitarian communities like Twin Oaks is, is like what you've described. Mm. But they've lasted a long time. So I don't know how much, you know, that plays into the factor of, uh, of uh, uh, long lasting. Mm. Um, so we're definitely not an egalitarian community because uh, our decision making rests with uh, the core group and an extended uh, group of people who actively, uh, uh, who, who want to be active in the management of the community, whether they're actually filling a, uh, a, a payroll or whether they're, you know, I've got the time and the energy and, and it's to whatever extent that they do. Mm -hmm. And we, we, uh, we meet, uh, we have five, five days a week in the morning, uh, we, we have a meeting called the planning session. And this is where we try to deal with whatever needs to be dealt with in the operations of the community. This is relationships, policies, pragmatic, how we're going to get this to there and then get that back over to here. Uh, all the logistics, whatever it is involved. And um, that has, uh, this is where our, the feedback learning and, and the being open to communication and the whole idea of wanting to, uh, to hear the other person, and what they're thinking uh, uh, is sustained and, and, and practiced. Um, we found that uh, if there is a conflict and the people can move into a space where they will want to hear the other, then we can think together and then we can resolve the conflict. We don't always do that, you know, but we, we are substantially, we have had a lot of substantial success in doing that and that's really been the key piece that's been, for uh, my perspective, the key piece that's fed the longevity of the community and also the, the balance and, uh, that we have. Um, so rather than prevent conflict, we allow it. That's part of life. And then we do our best in working with it and making the most of it because it also brings real opportunity it opens up your mind to different ways of thinking um, i remember one time we were in a meeting and it was about one of the stores and uh one person on the staff of the store was making a very strong proposal about changing the, the uh, a major way the store operated and uh and she explained it and laid it out you know, my response was, that doesn't make any sense. And someone else in the group said, Michael, it doesn't make any sense to you, but it's making a lot of sense to her. You got to understand how that makes sense to her in order to understand the proposal. So, I mean, that was, that was, that was just like, a, a moment when I really, really got what we were trying to do at a very, at a much deeper level. Mm -hmm. So, so that was, that's, that's the whole way that we, that, that we uh, uh, try our best to approach conflict. Really trying to get a sense of what this means to the other and, and what it means to the people who are being impacted so that everyone is getting more and more information about the, the full scope of the issue and the dynamics underlying the issue. Because a lot of times the conflict isn't with the actual uh, strategic or policy or practical impl uh, implementations. It's about there's something else going on between you and me mm. that's not working here. And that's what we need to get to. And, and that's been uh, 
the capacity that we've been uh, able to develop uh, to a, you know, a very a significant extent. And it's, uh, <clears throat> I think it's, it's, it's one of the major lackings in the, in the overall society that people just don't know how to deal with those things effectively and they don't get dealt with. Which it goes back to the original purpose of why we started out in the beginning with. So it seems like you guys really value open communication and how do you do that while still adhering to your values and being respectful of each other? Well, the way you're presenting the question suggests that there's a conflict between the two. And uh, I don't think there is a conflict between the two. Mm. I think the only way, if you and I are in, a, in some kind of a, a real strong disagreement, my way of respecting you and your way of respecting me involves hearing me. Mm. I'm not willing to hear you, I'm not respecting you. I think that uh, people really want to respect each other, but when somebody has something to say that really threatens me, because I do have my identity, I do have a fixed identity, there's a, there's a certain fixedness to it, my basic security is anchored in many ways to who I think I am, whether that makes log whether that's logical or not logical. And so the conflict comes when there's something about what you're saying to me that's disturbing me. So what is it? I mean, you're just saying something to me. You might be saying, you are a typical white male, and this is the way you're coming across, and this is, you're doing this, and this is really imposing on me in ways I don't want to be imposed on. Mm. And I'm going like, no, I'm not doing that. And then all we're going to do is battle. So the question is, is how can you say that? Because that's what's going on for you. That's your truth, your reality. Yeah. How can I be, come, become able to accept and receive your reality so I can then evaluate it? Right. I can't evaluate it unless I really get it, right? Because I don't know what I'm evaluating unless I get it. I don't have to agree with you. And we can, that could be a whole other part of the conversation, mm -hmm. but I have to get it first. So my respecting you is giving you the space to get your point, your, your experience through to me. And your respecting me is to respect the struggle that I might have in doing that. And we've got a group of people with us who are all contributing and helping to do that. Mm. And I would rapidly add, if we can. Yeah. Because sometimes we don't. So, but, uh, I think that we've all embedded in embodied cultures from our previous situations that are full of unresolved conflicts yeah. that because we don't know how to get to them in, in a constructive way. And that's, that was the whole point of the project. I mean, we just, I just, been learning more and more and more about how complicated and difficult this is and how challenging it is and uh, 
So the, the experiment has worked enormously well in terms of, oh, wow, well, that's involved too. That's another part of it. That's another piece. Mm -hmm. And then that opens up more questions. You know, and it isn't that we come up, ah, here is the way. It's just like we're there trying to do it as well as we can. And we've been able to do that for 40 years. That's rather substantial, I think. Definitely. Yeah. It's constantly evolving. And so how mm -hmm. have you sustained Ghana's for 40 years and how will it continue? We've sustained it by being able to, to stick to trying to, uh, to live it. And we've been able to develop enough skills in caring and concern, uh, connection with each other, uh, and to, to, to value what it is that we've been learning and uh, appreciating everyone's efforts to, to incorporate this so that we can have a richer and fuller life. And, uh, and to try to help people who come in who are kind of like, oh my God, what are you doing? You know, to understand what we're doing. Mm. Uh, but it's, it's the key to, to, the, to the sustaining is we're primarily interested in listening and understanding and then to then we can start to think together and work out what needs to be worked out i think many things fail not because the original purpose is is off not because the desire uh, uh, for it to, to, to work is off or the a lot of times the the necessary physical and financial resources are adequate enough to get going but we just simply can't deal with the stuff that we have to deal with between us without it turning into something more negative than it was before yeah i think a lot of conflicts comes out of a lack of understanding and just receptivity in general like you mm -hmm. can't understand somebody if you're not listening, if you're just waiting to impose your beliefs upon somebody else. Right. And listening involves so much more than, than I thought listening involved. Mm -hmm. I was listening and, and getting logical stuff that I could argue with. But that so many times just didn't uh, didn't capture what was going on for the other person and what they were trying to communicate. And so how has being in New York City been a challenge for being a community? Well, there's an assumption that it's a challenge because it's New York City. I think almost all of us would say is, God, that's wonderful. <laughs> mm. I mean, New York City was, in, 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 in fact, in, uh, uh, most of those six or seven people who started it were out in San Francisco when they made the decision that they wanted to do this. And, um, and they said, well, look, I mean, New York City is the best place to do it. You can really be crazy in New York City, where you can't be so crazy in other places. So <laughs> here we 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 uh, the choice was to do it in New York City, and uh, and there's just fascinating resources in New York City, and New York City exists because it's able to manage an enormous amount of diversity. So. Yeah, New York City, uh, uh, definitely for me, is a, has, has been a major asset for doing this. Yeah, um, you also acquired the land 
during the right time in New York City. Like now to start a community in New York City, it's almost unattainable because of the high rent costs. And also in the 80s, it was an interesting time because a lot of landlords were abandoning buildings and people were squatting. And a lot of those are now cooperative Mm -hmm. housing. So yeah, it's, it's become more structured now to attain housing in New York, I would say. Yes, that's very, very true. I mean, it's been it's a, uh, an enormously different market. However, you can immediately step back from that and say, well, what's going to happen now as a result of the pandemic? Mm. How is that going to change things? What are the opportunities going to be? When we came to New York, we, th- I mean, we had an intention, and if uh, and the marketplace was con- uh, 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 more supportive of that in by far than what it would be now, or w- what it would have been yesterday, because I mean, now is we don't know where tomorrow is going to be. Um, But if the intent is to create a place where people can really relate and talk to each other and work through problems in order to make the whole thing work better, I have worked so much better as a result of being here. And that's been my my transformation in that regard has been a major contribution one of my major contributions to the development of the community that it's where the individual and, and, the, and the social become um, mutually supportive mutually contributing that we're not at uh, at odds that what do I have to do to get what I want here is you know, becomes less and less and less of an issue. Uh, I mean, we're born and we have this wonderful gift of a life and I can't make much of it without other people. That starts with my parents and my siblings, you know, and so the more if, if people want to create a space in which they are going to get the most from each other in order to make that community more beneficial to everybody, it can be done. But it takes one hell of a lot of work. And you can't think that starting a worker cooperative or starting an intentional community is what will make it work. There are better structures for this, but the structure doesn't make it work. Mm -hmm. You make the structure work. Right. Yeah, like you were saying, it's the culture that encompasses the structure that really what makes it. Right. Um, And so what would you say is the well, before that, what would be the process of becoming a member of Ghana's? Well, right now, given the pandemic, everything is uh, is is stopped in terms of new people uh, coming in, mm-hmm. and uh, so, but. Uh, the basic way it has been, and, and I assume it will, and whenever we can resume it, we'll resume it, is, um, hey, I want to, uh, uh, you sound like you have an interesting thing going on. I want to come in and live there or come and check it out so I can see if it's really something I would want to do. All right, come. Come, come and you know, and 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 find out, you know, what it works for you. You will have to have uh, 
enough money to cover the monthly dues, which is basically uh, $920. And uh, and a um, <clears throat> deposit uh, of nine hundred and twenty, and um, that nine twenty covers everything you get living here, which is there's five cook dinners a, a a week, the toilet paper, the toothpaste, a, a, a kitchen that is kept stocked. Each house has its own kitchen; they're all stocked five days a week. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, internet, social life, you know, you know the whole nine yards, or the whole 920 yards. <laughs> um, so, but we're, uh, uh, we're, we're open to that. Now, a lot of people say, I can't do that and I need to have work. Well, uh, we can't provide work. We can only provide the work that we actually have. And uh, so we have uh, two stores uh, now, and uh, and we have the staff that uh, does the maintenance work, the housekeeping, the books, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for the for the community. And uh, there has to be an opening within that range for us to say we have a we have a, a can offer you some kind of work. So generally, you guys have vacancy for people to move in. Yes, we usually do. There's usually, and there may be sometimes there may be a, a, a waiting period, but you know, usually uh, there is a, there is some kind of vacancy. Uh, and what would you say is the greatest challenge in nurturing an intentional community? The greatest challenge in doing what? In nurturing an intentional community. So I'll answer that in turn from the perspective of an individual. Here I am, I'm a member of this community. What is the best thing I can do consistently to nurture the community? And I would answer that question at least partially, but uh, substantially by uh, an idea that we've been really very good with from, from very early on, and that is Say yes if something is requested of you, unless there is a good reason to say no. Let your first response be yes. You want that? What can I do to help you with getting it? How can, yes, pass the salt, yes. Help me, I'm moving, room. I'm moving from this house to that house. I need help, can you help? Yes. No, I can't, my leg's broken, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And that simple practice means people are constantly engaged in mutual benefit, right. mutuality. I mean, there's many more answers, many more pieces to it, but just to give a very simple, succinct uh, answer, that I would I would go back to that one, right. and and it's it's played a, a big role in in the success of our country, of our community. So you would say it's a challenge to say yes, or you oh. say, you're saying that this is the benefit. That's the benefit. Uh, that's yeah, but it is a challenge. When you, when people ask you, "Hey, can you do this?" It's, I mean, you have to look and see, you know, you know. There's all kinds of uh, no, no. I don't want to do that. I'm being exploited. Uh, you're taking advantage of me. You're. Uh, why would I do that? You, uh, uh, you made a mess over such as, and I had to clean it up. So why should I do that for you? 
Hmm. But so, you can bring that up as a, now, you, you know, if I have that reaction, I can bring that up as a question, a real question. Or someone can say, Michael, look at that as a real question rather than as a justified response. If you open it as a question, then we can talk about it. Right. And then I might get persuaded to do, you know, oh, no, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, yeah, I'll go do it. Hmm. Or no, I'm sorry, I'm just not. That's I'm not convinced. So, I ha I, as far as I can evaluate, have a legitimate reason to say no. Mm -hmm. And so, would you say that the chain of keeping the chain of giving going is the greatest benefit, or is there another? Um, thing about the community that you would say is hugely beneficial about being in the community yeah. is beneficial oh. mm -hmm. so the other day in planning session we were talking about a very major decision and it had a lot of complex pieces to it and um, I really didn't know how to get a hold of it or how I thought about it or uh, to really get an adequate understanding. And so we had just a 45 minute go around in which everyone was saying, well, at, at the moment, this is the way I'm thinking about it. This is what I think. And I think we ought to do this or we should definitely, whatever it was that was really prominent for them in, in, in that moment. And uh, as we went around in that uh, conversation, I actually to say it went around, that's, that's actually the old format because we now have to do our planning sessions in which it's a combination of a few people in the room where we usually have it and other people on Zoom because of the pandemic thing. So, you know, anyway, um, it, was, it was just like, I got clearer and clearer about the, the problem, what's all involved in it. I would became more and more able to think about it. And after it was over, I just said, yeah, you guys, I just want to say this because I just, really uh, uh, sensing it at this moment, at this moment uh, I really like being part of this group because I can think so much better than I can by myself. Mm -hmm. okay. And I think it's, and it's also say, I would never have been in the three businesses that we started unless there were people who wanted to do those businesses. I would have never been engaged in this project unless there were people who wanted to do it and we came together to do it. I, and it's just been such a rich experience for me. So. It's amazing. Yeah, the power of the collective. And. And also, the, don't forget the power of the collective is also most the terror of the collective. I mean, there's real issues and real problems that, that we have to look at, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, a lot of, I think a lot of things fail because people think, oh, we're not going to have those problems anymore. No way, Jose. You're going to have them and they're going to be magnified because you're looking at them and they're right in your face. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a way to work with them. Right. Yeah, I think it's really powerful that you guys hold each other accountable and you address issues as they arise rather than just putting it underneath the rug. As well as we can. <laughs> that has to be tagged on to every, everything. Mm. Yeah. It's an evolving process. 
And so knowing what you know now, what advice would you have given yourself when you first started the community? Excuse me, can you say it again? I didn't hear it all. Yeah, knowing what you know now, what advice would you have given yourself when you first started the community? Dude, if you really want to do this, strap yourself in. It's going to be one hell of a trip. Yes, I like that. Awesome. That's it. It was so lovely to learn about Ghana's intentional community. Thank you so much, Michael, for sharing your time and energy with me. And yeah, I look forward to posting this on the Cooperative Journal's website as well as GEO. Okay, yes. It's, we, we definitely want to post it on, uh, on GEO. That's just grassroots economic newsletter, geo.coop, just to get a plug in there. Also, maybe the Communities Magazine will cross post it as well. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. But thank you very much. For, uh, I, I really appreciate the opportunity for the, uh, the interview. Thank you.